Well, we have Jer- Jerome Myers on the call. Jerome is is involved in a couple of ventures. And before we even start, I'm going to send you over to uh, a couple of his websites, uh, jeromemyers.co. Um, Jerome, do you have any preference of where you'd like to send people here today just so they can maybe follow along? Because we're going to be specifically talking about high performance habits. Yeah, jeromemyers.co is a place to go. From there, you can get anywhere else that you need to go. That's kind of the roadmap for the folks who are interested in learning more about what we have going on over here. So with all that be- being said, uh, you know, y- y- Jerome has a ton of things going on and, and especially regarding the high performance habits, but he's also involved in some multi-million dollar uh, portfolio and multifamily investing. So maybe we'll be touching on that in the end. But uh, I really wanted to focus on the high performance habits because I think the mindset aspects of real estate investing and being entrepreneurial is kind of lacking, uh, to be honest, on on my show here. So, uh, Jerome, when you talk about high performance habits, like let's talk about that in regards to real estate investors. Like, what's some of the low hanging fruit that you've run into in talking to real estate investors that they could maybe focus on and and incorporate and make it become habits? Yeah, that's a great question because I think the majority of us feel like we've got it figured out because we've been successful in some regard, in some arena, and at some level up to this point. And I think for the majority of us, if we really take a step back, we probably haven't ever reached a potential that we truly aspire to. We came just short of it or we fell really short of it depending on what the goal was. And so when I think about high performance habits is how do I get across the finish line instead of just to or just below it? The majority of people come into the real estate industry and they do it without much education and they usually don't have some type of mentor. And so they are self-taught and they're using free mediums in order to get it. What I think most of us miss out on is that that stuff's never end to end. It's always disconnected or disjointed. You get a little nugget here and a little nugget there, but you you never get a a full plate. And so having that comprehensive knowledge is kind of the base allows you to elevate the triangle or the pyramid that I think every investor is dealing with. And that pyramid has four levels. It's knowledge on the base, deal flow is second level, Experience partners is the third level, and then capital is the fourth. And I think a lot of people get that out of order, but I can guarantee you if you extend the pyramid in that order, you'll get your deals closed faster and you'll probably have a more profitable business. Sure. So no, that that's a that's a very good point, especially about getting that knowledge. Unfortunately, I think what what happens in some cases, and I, I run into this frankly quite a bit is that we we deal with this analysis paralysis that we we consume and consume and consume and then without ever taking that real action. Yeah, but I think there's the other side of that too, Jack, where people will go in and they will just go take action and it's not well thought through and then they end up in a pickle and it may be okay on a 20 or 30,000 dollar house, but if you're going to do that on a 2 or 3 million dollar property, you can end up in a place where you can't get back out if you're not careful. And so I think depending on the sophistication sophistication of the deal that folks are trying to do, and even if you're doing those smaller deals, eventually you don't just want to do one of those. You want to scale. You may want to do five of them at a time or something. You want to make sure that you're in a great place and coming in with strategy and being super intentional about the actions that you're taking. And being intentional is usually tied to having the proper foundation. So when you talk about being intentional, are you talking about actually doing the exercise and, and writing some things down and, and actually planning it out? What, what I've, I've kind of one of my taglines, I think it's become one of my taglines is the, is the fact that I've said a time and time again, it, it becomes, it's a, it's a dream. If you're just kind of carrying it around, it doesn't actually become a target until you actually write it down. Yeah. So the writing does a tremendous amount for creating clarity. I think most people think, oh yeah, I thought about it. It's kind of good. I'm going to go with it. And what they don't really think through is all of the things that could go wrong. And That's the beauty of the actual writing or the typing, depending on how they want to get the ideas out of their head and onto paper. 
what I've learned is that if you have to explain what you're doing to somebody else, your plan is so much more cohesive and it dramatically increases the likelihood of success whenever that happens. And so, yes, writing is part of it. Spending some time in meditation and visualizing is another part of it. And then actually going and taking the action is probably the final piece to make that dream a reality. And some people say, well, it's not going to be right. For instance, when I do a multifamily property analysis, I know that the numbers that I put on the paper are not going to be the numbers that come in the door. My expenses are going to be high or low. My income is going to be higher or lower. But the exercise of actually going through and thinking through what could go wrong, what to expect, what to think is invaluable, right? Because I've actually come up with risk mitigation strategies before the thing actually happened that we're concerned about happening. So, you know, when, when we're talking about this as well and, and the, the process of writing it down and, and taking action, what I actually found really useful is that I, I actually put down not only like what my goals are and doing some of that visualization, but I actually started putting down and made a list of like, these are the actionable items that actually generate money that, that are actually worthwhile. And that, that is what I should be focused on during business hours, if you will. That's when everybody else is operating and doing their business versus designing my next logo or business card or what have you. That, that was, that was set aside for business hours. If it wasn't under these core tasks, I was, I tried not to allow myself to do it during those business hours. Yeah. So I I call them profit producing activities. And I think the majority of your calendar should be spent on those. I'm not as extreme as you (laughs) that you probably should have 60 to 80% of your time. If you're the person responsible for revenue in your company on the profit producing activities, and then the other time can be spent on admin or lead generation or some of the other things that are necessary in order for your business to run. But, you know, that 60, 80%, if you're wearing multiple hats is probably, I think the sweet spot. And the thing that I've seen most top performers do, I I call, I don't really call them top performers. I call them apex performers. They color code their calendar. And so there isn't time in their day that isn't allocated kind of similar to what you would hear Dave Ramsey say on his uh, budget where it ends up at zero every month. Everything, every minute gets an allocation and depending on how it's being spent, it gets a color. And so if it's profit producing, you give it a green color because you're making money. If it's admin type stuff, we tend to put that in red because it's not actually making money, but it's necessary in order to run the business. And then if you're doing like some external promotion, maybe a yellow. And if there's like development calls, another color. And then if you've got some content marketing that you do, you know, that's probably another color. It's not really admin. It's more of a marketing function. So you don't want to lump it in with the other stuff because eventually that will lead to some revenue for you. Sure. No, that's kind of an interesting concept of color coding. You know, I, I have, I have a variety of calendars and each calendar has its own color code, but I've never thought about uh, categorizing it down to the task level like that. Yeah, we we use one calendar, right? We use one calendar and we put everything there in the various colors. And if you do a glance at your week, if you look at four or five days on your week, you can see really clearly if you're in a profitable week or not. And then at the end of the month, you should see a very different a balance in your account. So outside of that, like what other tips and strategies would you have for us that uh, regarding these top producers? I think the one thing that a lot of us, and it's funny, that's going to end up being a pun. The one thing a lot of the Apex performers do is they do mm-hmm. one thing. They figured out what they want to be best in the world at best in class. And if you go to the book, Good to Great, they talk about the hedgehog concept if you read the book, The One Thing, but I think Jay Keller and I forget the other guy's name, but it begins with the P. They talk about finding that one thing or one, making a decision, that one decision that allows you to not have to make a ton of other decisions. And then there's also, what can you be best in class at? 
when you're best at class, you're able to be compensated at a level that a mediocre performer could never dream of, right? For some folks who do coaching, they make about $50,000 a year. There are other people who make that on a single client. And so what's the difference between them? Uh, for a lot of people, it's the amount of results they get. And some of it's brand positioning, but results are necessary in order to be able to command a fee. The only way that you get that good at something is if you're if you focus on it. And so getting really clear on what you're uniquely put on this planet to do and then doing that. Uh, David Messler talks about activities and he says he said this thing and it just stuck with me on so many different levels because it made me rethink life. He said, I get there are activities that I get paid for and there are activities that I don't get paid for. And that's just how I live my life. And it allows me to engage and interact with people in a very genuine space. And if they ask me to do something that I get paid for, I let them know that, hey, that's something that I get paid for. And here's what it would cost for me to do that for you. And then if they ask, hey, can you make an introduction or do some of these other things? He does that, doesn't ask for anything, and he's glad to do it. And when you have that level of clarity, in addition to that thing that you're put on this planet to do, it makes it really easy for you not to be awkward when you're having conversations with folks, when you're doing business development, or if you're out networking, because, you know, a lot of people have a fear of being the sleazy salesperson, but if you're going to grow your enterprise, you're going to have to make offers and get people to accept those offers in order to get revenue through the door. Or if you're in the real estate business, accept your your offer to purchase the property or sell it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. One of those things that you you just brought out, I'm, I'm going to go go back to what you just said here in just a second, but I just wanted to remind everybody, head over to Jer Jerome Myers.co and I'll make sure to have that link in the show notes because uh, I know that there's quite a few resources there for people as well. But you, what you just said is that uh, you you decide on what you're going to focus on. I, as we all know, it, it's what what we focus on is what, unfortunately, in the real estate industry, I think there's a lot of shiny ob- object syndrome. You know, we, you might start with wholesaling. The next thing you know, you you see the allure of rental properties and the multifamily properties. And next thing you know, you're you're spread out in a variety of ways. And frankly, I think a bit too thin. How do you, how do you keep things constrained a little bit so you can, you can focus on one or two things? I'm the guy that dropped out of corporate America without a plan B, right? I I thought I was going to go buy an apartment building and that didn't work out the way that I thought it was going to work out initially. Eventually I was able to be successful at it, but 10 banks told me, no, they weren't going to give me loans. And I had to pivot and go fix and flip and do some wholesaling and a bunch of other stuff in the interim time until I actually had the network necessary to actually get the first deal done. With that said, if you're looking to transition, make sure that you transition. It's kind of like having a closet, right? You you go open the closet and everybody's got one. I, I don't care how good you are. Everybody had a closet it's got so much stuff in it that you don't want anybody to open the closet. Everybody mm-hmm. does. And you don't want that to be your business because if that's your business, then it's really difficult for you to show it off to folks. If you go into a space and they say, Hey, what do you do? Or how do you earn a living? Or how are you serving people? And he's like, well, I do this and I do this and I do this and I do this. I'm probably not going to hire you for any of that. And I'm probably going to not think. And for me, I was like, Oh, that makes me sound sophisticated and I got this really big company and really not making money in any of the stuff that we're doing. But there is a thing that you are, again, uniquely positioned on to do and leaning into that isn't going to let you or make you lose money. It's going to help you make more because you have laser focus. For instance, I buy real estate, multifamily real estate in a market. I talk to people and they buy the Carolinas. So they buy not only a city or a neighborhood or a street, they buy the whole state. It's impossible for you to look at all those deals. So really, what are you looking for? The other thing is, if you want to get referred, if you want people to think of you when you're not in the room, you need to be very precise in the problem that you solve so that they are triggered when that thing comes up and somebody's looking for help. Has somebody asked me for 
a reference for YouTube ads today. If I didn't know anybody that did YouTube ads, I wouldn't be able to make that referral. And, you know, there may be a marketing guy who does SEO and then he does social media marketing and he does this and, oh yeah, he does social media, uh, YouTube ads as well. I'm probably not going to recommend that person because they're not the expert to help this person get to that next place, if that makes sense. No, that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, that that's one of the reasons, you know, I find that a lot of a lot of what we've been doing, especially lately, is the is the wholesaling and fix and flipping. You know th- those type of aspect, aspects dealing with single family homes, where we we can. It's amazing through word of mouth and you showing that type of specialization how it kind of spread spreads in your market. I think you want to be the person that gets thought of when a particular problem comes up as being the person that can solve it. I think if you can get there and enough people know that you're that person, you won't ever have to worry about revenue generation in your business. Right. You know, I'm always curious about this. You know, you you personally are a motivational speaker. I mean, you go to your website and there's a variety of topics. In fact, I think you even hold kind of a very uh, unique title at your dream catcher, catcher's uh, company where you're the chief inspirational officer. Um, I, I just find it really interesting. How do you maintain your mindset? Is it something that it's just nat come natural to you or are you constantly feeding yourself with books? Well, obviously books, you, you've already rattled off a few that, that you were referencing, but, uh, is this an ongoing battle for you or is it something that comes natural? I wish I was that talented and gifted and confident in myself, but in no way, shape or form is that the truth. So most mornings I get up before five o'clock and I don't don't spend time with anybody else until after nine. And that time for me is spent on working on myself. And it's a combination of things. It's meditation, it's journaling, it's affirmations, it's working out in some way, shape or form, it's working on a foreign language, it's reading. And doing those things put me in a position in a state where I can go out and serve people. And that's literally what I want to do on a daily basis. I want to fill my cup up so that when I pour out of it, I don't run dry. That is especially interesting. I think that, and and there's a lot of people that are lacking in that. You, you, you spend 5 a.m. to 9 a.m. working on yourself and, and it's, proven time and time again. And I don't know how, how often I can reiterate this concept is that that is probably the best and biggest investment you can possibly make. I know we talk about multifamily investing and wholesaling and, and fix and flipping, but that time spent on working on yourself like you are, I I don't know if there's a better and bigger return. You won't get a better return on the investment on any other investment. The the thought that the things are going to be more profitable than what you can do is an illusion. Our ability to grow our assets, our wealth, our portfolio, our business is totally tied to our capacity as a person, our leadership skills, our ability to influence, our confidence, our ability to attract top talent to come help us execute against our mission. All of that is tied to who we are. And if you have, if you don't have what you want, it's because you haven't grown into the person that you need to be in order to have it. That mm-hmm. might offend some of the listeners. They may cut the episode off, Jack, but. No, I, I just find it fascinating that, I mean, you know, just you saying you spend 5 a.m. to 9 on yourself every day, it just proves I'm, I'm not probably putting in the amount of time that I need to. I mean, that's setting aside that amount of time. It speaks volumes as to the importance in your life. It's probably a little outrageous. It's not practical for most people. I think those who follow the miracle morning are doing an hour. I think how Hal Elrod has them in and out in less than an hour. But, you know, I, I want to live an extraordinary life, Jack, and I want to help other people do that. And if people are coming to me to help them figure out how to make their dreams a reality and fight off their fears. I got to have a whole lot in me. So when the situation comes up, I can pull from the resources and give to them so that they can go off and accomplish the tasks that they're trying to accomplish. Sure. 
You know, one of the things too, before I got into real estate investing and, and listening to the amount of books and podcasts and everything that I do, you know, it, w- what I think is funny now, like five years ago, I would have told you, you know, the journaling, the vision boards, all this mindset stuff was a bunch of hooey that it, there was nothing associated with it. And how do you, con- how do you convince people or how do you, how do you get them when the light bulb goes off? for them to realize that there is actually something to all of this. I love that question. It's who we, it's woo woo, <laughs> law of attraction, and you don't have to do anything. Yeah. Faith without works is dead, right? You got to do something, but here's the thing. If you don't believe it, then you won't take the action. If you don't take the action, you won't get the result. You have to do something to believe. And if you're not seeing yourself with, the for me it's the cars right like i i want a lamborghini aventador i look at it most days all day every day because it sits on the desk with me if i can't see myself with it it won't ever come it Mm -hmm. happens twice first in your mind then in the physical everything that's in your world happened first in your mind then it showed up in the physical and so until you can prove to yourself in your mind that this is possible for you it won't happen And we can run down the list of all the things. Now, the other piece of that is the actual work. And what most people will do is say, I want this thing. And then they just wait for it to show up and nothing happens. So they don't get it. And you get it through a strategy. Mm -hmm. And a strategy is usually based on somebody who already went down the, let's call it the ski slope. And they cut in the path so that you can find your way. Now, it might be covered up because there was some new snowfall, but if you look closely, you can see the tracks. You can see where you should go and end up safely down at the bottom of the hill. That's where you're trying to get to. But most people don't look for that. And so when those folks actually do go on that journey, they, they kind of get lost. And when they get lost, they, they terminate the actual mission, which is it's a great disservice. We, when we don't do what we're supposed to do on, on this planet, we're keeping somebody else from doing it. And it's a whole lot of obligation. They probably didn't turn on this real estate podcast for that, Jack. But here, if you don't do what you're supposed to do and you're uniquely positioned to do it, if you don't do what you're supposed to do, there's somebody else who's not going to be able to do what they're supposed to do because you didn't put your piece into the puzzle. So the puzzle's not complete. We, we can't complete the puzzle without you doing your thing. So we've got to get you to a place where you actually do the thing. And that dream that you had in your mind or that tug that you have in your heart to do something, it's not there by chance. It's not there by accident. It's not there because somebody marketed it to you because that's what you're supposed to do. It's why you're here. You know, that, that reminds me of a recent conversation I had with somebody else that, um, and we were talking about how it, it's almost, you know, I hate to, I, I don't want to say go into spirituality, but uh, frankly, there is a there is a level there of like you said obligation responsibility and I almost want to say stewardship where we we do have an obligation in order to to accomplish certain things. So the beautiful thing about this world, this life that we have is every day that you wake up you're one day closer to not being here. Nobody knows when the clock actually runs out, but you know that you're one day closer to not being here. And if you think that you deserve breath just because you woke up, then you're probably taking the most beautiful gift in the world for granted. I believe that you have to earn your breath. I, I And I think you earn your breath by making progress on your mission. And so if you're actually making progress on the mission and you're earning your breath, then I think you end up being rewarded by with more days so that you can actually complete the mission that you're placed here for. And it doesn't matter what you believe in. What is your payment to whatever you believe in for you being here in the time that you have? I, I remember when I was, I was 30 and my buddy from high school who played linebacker on our team, we were co-captains of the team. He died. He died. His brother passed away a few weeks before he died not there long after. And he was one of the best people that I ever met on the face of the planet. And to think that I was still alive and he wasn't here was a shocker. Because if I was in a head-on collision with a dump truck and I didn't die, how on earth could Hambone not be here? 
So I, I, I don't think people really understand how fleeting life can be. And I don't know that they're actually doing everything they can to make the most of the opportunity that they have. Mm. And that troubles me. Yeah, it should trouble a lot of people. And, and uh, uh, boy, that, that really hit me hard, to be frank. I mean, the way, you've just, the way you just put that. Um, so with, with all of this, you know, we've also, we also talk quite a bit about being around like-minded individuals, um, finding mentorship and, and that type of thing. How important is it for people to find whether in their backyard or somebody that they can then lean on in the, in a type of mentorship type role? You already talked, talked about the ski slope and seeing those previous skis, I, I, I also, one of the, the, one of the taglines or the tagline of this show is we can either put in 10,000 hours and be an, an expert or learn from people that have already made that investment. How important is that in your, in your eyes? I am a fan of Tony Robbins and he talks about collapsing decades into days. And I think that is really true. You know, I believe that you learn more from the mistakes of others than you'll ever learn from their successes. And so I don't really care how successful a person is, right? What I want to know is what lessons did they learn? What mistakes did you make? Because if I can avoid those mistakes, then I can, you know, go through the school of hard knocks at a higher level task. It's always interesting when we talk about, you know, poverty and education and you, you got those kids who only eat when they go to school and they won't eat again, until they get back to school. And if they don't have that, how are they ever going to learn, right? Because they're trying to figure out how they're going to sustain themselves. They're, they don't care about what's happening in trigonometry. And so I think about mistakes that way. As an investor, you know, what mistake can I learn from that Jack made so that I can skip over that and then go to the next one? And, you know, some of us get embarrassed. We don't want anybody to know that we made mistakes, but I don't care who a person is. In fact, the more successful they are, the more mistakes they made because it's a part of the process. It's the only way to actually get there. Right. I, and, and I, I think that's, again, Jerome, you're kind of blowing my mind here today. So you focus on people's mistakes and learning from those mistakes, you know, it, in, in our world, and, and uh, the gurus that are out there, it, it seems like there is a huge focus on the successes and we rarely take a minute to talk about the mistakes. Yeah, it's one of my problems with the industry, if I'm totally frank. I don't care about how many thousands in the multifamily space. It's all about door counts or assets under management. I don't care how many doors you own. Right? I want to know what your first deal was if the, I'm in a place where I'm going from zero to one. Or I want to know about your 15th deal if I'm in the space where I'm scaling. And where did you go wrong? When did you hire staff? When did you realize that you were out over your skis? If you filed bankruptcy, what could you have done to prevent that? Like, I, I want to know where what potholes I need to avoid, right? Because if I can do that, then I can really direct my energy on the other stuff and really work hard to be successful. You wouldn't be here as a thought leader if you weren't successful. You don't need to beat your chest and tell me how successful you are. It's probably written in your bio when you come in. And you know the beautiful thing about what you did when you introduced me is you didn't go through the accolades. You didn't go through the other stuff. You brought me on. And I think the credibility that you have with your audience allows us to come in and have this authentic conversation and hopefully I've said something over the course of this episode that gives them a reason to continue to want to listen to us, right? But I want to teach them from the places where I've seen mistakes, I've made mistakes. So it's not just theory or concept. It's something that I know to be true. Yeah. You know, and, and you, you bring up the fact that I didn't go into detail regarding your background, but I've just learned that, you know, as, as a guest... You've, you've told your story a million times. And in fact, you know, we direct people to your website where, uh, you know, they can, they can get that detail and, and our time here is brief. So I guess I kind of jump into the meat and potatoes. I, I do the same thing. I, I think it's the fastest way. Like I'm not just going to bring anybody to my audience. The person's going to be credible. So now let's have a great conversation, right? And listen in and let 
you decide for yourself. And, you know, the older I get, the more gray hairs I get, the, the more I realize you can tell if somebody's real or not. You can tell if they're authentic and showing up in a way that's actually going to positively impact your life. Mm-hmm. You really can. So, you, you know, you know, if, if you have a time stop, let me know, but I'm, I'm just going to keep going, Jerome. I, I need to understand. I need to know what are a couple of your biggest mistakes that you, we can learn from. Where do you want to go? You want to go personal? You want to go multifamily? It's, How about one of each? How about one of each? Yeah. So multifamily, I'll, I'll cluster in a bunch on a single deal. How hopefully that makes sense. So the first contract that I wrote in Greensboro, North Carolina, I bought off of a letter that I sent to an owner. The owner owned multiple properties. We ended up buying a 20 unit and an eight unit from him. In the model on the 20 unit, I modeled my taxes on a building that we were buying for $850,000 at $1,000 a year. Now, I missed it. My partners in the deal missed it. The bank missed it. And when we got the bill at the end of the year, it was a $10,000 tax bill, which is more appropriate for a deal of that size. And I didn't know what to do with that. And if you understand the way that properties are evaluated, you realize that I literally changed the valuation of the property at the minimum $100,000. Shame on me for not putting the expenses in the way that they were supposed to be put in. I I made the mistake. I I didn't have the appropriate mentorship or people looking over my shoulder to make sure that I did the right thing. In that same deal, we went into one of the units in the eight unit property and we looked up and we saw that the central HVAC unit or registers were taped off. And we're like, why would anybody have central HVAC and then use a window unit? And so we tried to turn it on and it was like, ah, it just kept cutting off. So we tried to turn it on again. And then we went outside. It's like the fan spinning. It seems like it should be okay. And then when we went back in the unit, there was this awful smell in the unit. We didn't know what was going on, but we looked at the owners like, hey, do you know what's up with this? And he's like, ah, don't worry about it. They're just weird. Some people don't want central HVAC. They just want to have the window units. I, I wouldn't worry about it. Everything's fine. And so we go in, we close the deal, and then we get our new property manager engaged. They're saying, hey, we're going to get this fixed. We did inspections. They send an HVAC person in to check out, see what's going on. And we find that a possum had fallen into the furnace, got burned onto the strips, and we needed to replace not only the unit, but the outside unit and all of the duct work in order to get the smell out. Uh, when they went to replace the unit, there was still a possum family living in the attic. And so we had to get an exterminator and it just became a big old mess, right? So what did I learn from that? Uh, take action. Yeah, kind of, right? You're talking mm-hmm. about potentially a couple of hundred thousand dollars on the pro forma from the taxes. You're talking about a $10,000 situation on the HVAC depending on which vendor you use and so on and so forth. So, you know, you're talking about real money and not everybody can just write a check to fix those problems. Right. And for me, I was like, oh man, I'm messing up. And then if I go back over to the 20 unit, we start rehabs over there and I didn't have all the utilities turned on in all of the units. And when I closed and we got ready to start renovation on one of the units, We turned the water on at the street. There was no cutoff valve in the actual unit. When we turned the water on, we get back to the front door because it was all the way across the parking lot. And we see water coming out of the bathroom, running down the stairs because it's a townhome unit to the front door. Like, what in the world is going on? So, hey, Rush, go turn the water off. Go turn the water off. We get into the unit. We see that water's run down into the kitchen. It's ruining the cabinets. Water's in the unit next door. And so all of these things were happening because I didn't spend the time to get the owner to turn the unit water on and make sure that there were no issues. The pipe in between the toilet and the shower broke. And that's why the unit was out of service when we toured it. The owner didn't tell us and we got a good surprise and got to buy two sets of cabinets and redo a kitchen and try to spend some money on a, or we spent money on a humidifier to get the water out of the hardwood floors that were ruined. So, Mm -hmm. you know, I, I made a ton of mistakes on that. And so what are the lessons? Always make sure that somebody who has more experience than you reviews your underwriting, always make sure all the utilities are turned on in every unit when, before you buy it. So you can make sure 
that is checked. Now, mind you, I paid the person to do a due diligence inspection, but when the power is not on, when the water is not on, they just shrug their shoulders and move on to the next unit. And then I think the last piece is if somebody says, hey, don't worry about it, it's not a big deal, you need to trust but verify because once the transaction closes, it's your problem. Right. And so that is my my multifamily story, where there's a ton of missteps and opportunity for a lot of people to learn. I think the personal one I'll tell you about and I alluded to it earlier is really about being a corporate America dropout. And so I left corporate America after building a 20 million dollar division for a Fortune 550. We had 30 percent profit margins. And my reward for that was getting a phone call on 455 on December 24th. And it went something like this. Hey, Jerome, I know we've been going back and forth on this, man, but we're going to lay him off. He's like, no, no, we're not going to lay him off. Like we need these people. We got to figure out something else to do with them. Yeah. You said that before. This isn't a discussion. I'm letting you know that I've made a decision. This is what we're going to do. No, no, no. Like that's not the right answer. We've got to figure something else out. Jerome, I'm telling you what's going to happen. Now you can be a part of it or not. It's totally up to you, but that's what's going to happen. And of course, I'm still advocating for the folks on my team. And then he says, Jerome, listen, I'm going to go spend the rest of the year with my family. We're going to lay half the staff off. I'll talk to you in the new year. And then I got the infamous three beefs that you get whenever a phone call is ended when you're still talking on an iPhone. For me, it was pretty disheartening because I thought we conquered the world and I didn't sleep through Christmas or New Year's and I didn't eat much and... I I just didn't feel like it was okay to do what we were doing. And so I I took the attitude, hey, they're making me. They're making me do that. And they didn't make me do anything. I I was a willing participant in the process. And so the mistake that I made was thinking that passing the buck in order to compromise my morals was the right thing to do. It wasn't. And it, it took me going through that process. And You know, on the backside, one of the folks that we laid off committed suicide. There were other people who lost a lot of stuff. Um, One guy didn't have health care after that. He got sick. He wasn't able to get the care he needed. He passed away. And I saw all these things happen. And I was like, I was a, I was part of the chain that launched all these events. And so I promised myself I would never do that again. And so when I saw that situation happen again, I realized like, this is not who I am. This is not what I want to do. And the fact that you have agency, the fact that you get to choose, nobody can make you do anything. Jack, nobody can make you do anything. In every situation, you get a choice. And I always get people to say, well, if somebody's holding a gun, then they are making me do it. No, you still get to choose. You may not like the alternative. You may not like the choices that are presented to you, but you always get a choice. And if I can inspire anybody not to give up the freedom of choice, then I think our job here is done. Well, you definitely, I now understand the focus that you have, especially regarding earlier, you talked about us having an obligation. I mean, your personal story there definitely echoes that and rings pretty loudly in my ears. Uh, I hope it does so with our listeners here today as well. Just one last time, I wanted to remind everybody to uh, definitely check out Jerome's website again, jeromemyers.co. I'm going to make sure to have that link in the show notes. But this was a fantastic conversation here today, Jerome. I I hope you'll consider coming back here. Uh, You have an open invite as far as I'm concerned. So uh, please take me up on that. And, uh, you know, I I went way over what I I told you I would here today. uh, But Before I let you go, is there a question or a concept or a thought that you wish we would have covered here today? Well, first of all, Jack, I'm so grateful for the opportunity to hang out with you today. And I'm extremely excited to come back and and do some more content with you. Yeah, the concept is just my thesis on life, man. Your dreams should be real. And so if you got to this point of the podcast and you're still here after I said all the stuff I said, then you're here to get that last nugget. And that nugget will free you. A lot of us get into the space. We're told that we need to be practical, but that practicality is the fastest way to mediocrity. And if you want to be a person who has a huge impact on the world, if you want to be a person who 
changes your family tree, right? If you're investing in real estate, it's because you're trying to create some wealth. And usually that gets passed on to other folks. You should have that. It should happen. But you got to have the right strategy. You need some support. And then you got to do the work. You, you, you get those three things with the right dream and you can change everything in your world. Total transformation. Well, thank you so much, Jerome. I, I hope we get to talk again very soon. And uh, if there's anything I can do for you, please let me know. I'm so grateful for the opportunity. Thank you, sir.